Blockchain technology holds tremendous potential to revolutionize countless industries. With cryptocurrency, DeFi, and NFTs, the list just keeps growing with each technological innovation that comes onto the scene. And in this video, I want to talk about another Web 3.0 use case that has been quietly brewing behind the scenes that is now starting to gain serious attention and has tremendous upside potential in the coming years. So trust me, you don't want to miss this. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know in this video as a blockchain developer myself who works this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, Hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to become a blockchain master, step by step start to finish, land your first blockchain developer job, increase your salary past 100K, I can show you how to do that over at dappversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, so let's get into this. So what is this application of blockchain technology that's getting a lot of steam with a ton of upside growth potential in the coming years? Well, it's Decentralized Science, or DSI for short. So this is a movement to improve science with Web 3.0 technologies, namely things like blockchains, smart contracts, and also decentralized storage protocols. So quick disclaimer, you know, I don't consider myself any type of scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I do understand this technology very deeply. And when I understand new industries and how it can impact those, particularly with the problems that face the scientific community, it definitely looks like blockchains have a ton of potential to improve the problems that face. And I'm gonna break those down in the video and why I think this trend has legs. And I also wanna give credit where credit was due. A lot of the research that I did ahead of time for this video came from the ethereum.org website and also this talk here that was given at ETHCC last year. So I'll put links to those down in the description below. All right, so let's get a quick summary of what decentralized science or DC I even is before I get into a concrete examples about how this works. So basically, decentralized science is a movement that aims to build public infrastructure of funding, creating, reviewing, crediting, storing, and disseminating scientific knowledge fairly and equitably using the Web 3.0 stack. So another way you can think about this is sort of like open source science powered by blockchains. And so let's see how that works with a bunch of different examples. We'll talk about some of the problems that the scientific community faces and how blockchains and Web 3.0 technology can improve these problems. So problem number one is coordination. So when you think about it, the scientific enterprise is a massive team effort. Yeah, things like research, experimentation, data collection, peer review, funding, and all this stuff has a bunch of different actors in place that have to coordinate to, together to basically just increase, you know, what we know from science. But the scientific community, like many other communities, coordinates in a very centralized way, which has an impact on things like funding, you know, small centralized groups typically control the distribution of funds and, you know, funding organizations and home institutions can limit your collaborations, like who you can actually work with inside the scientific community. But what if we just blew all this apart? What if we created a more decentralized ecosystem where, you know, the scientists across the entire world could freely collaborate with one another. It got easier to receive funding. You're not spending like all your time trying to apply for grants. And then we can like get new findings faster and actually increase the pace of, you know, scientific discovery. Well, that's a lot of what I'm going to try to explain throughout the rest of this video. But the number one issue here is the problem of coordination. That's what I'm talking about. So we've already seen experiments with this inside the scientific community to try to cope, you know, coordinate in more open source fashion. You remember before I talked about, you know, decentralized science being like an open source uh, science, you know, powered by blockchains. We've already seen efforts for scientists to collaborate using things like GitHub, but this takes it to the next step further. We're not just publishing your findings on GitHub and maybe coordinating with other teams this way and incentivizing open source contributors. This actually adds the ability to custody funds, to vote, to make decisions, and then also collaborate with data across the entire globe. And so that's where DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations come into play to basically solve the coordination problem full stack. OK, so let's talk about what a DAO is in the first place, how we're using DAOs already and how they can apply towards decentralized science or DSI. So basically, you know, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's essentially just an organization that runs on a blockchain. So basically, you have things like smart contracts that let people do things like vote on particular decisions that an, or a group of people want to make. And then the blockchain can actually govern the outcome of those decisions. So one of the most popular use cases for um you know, DAOs right now is treasury management. So let's say that you have a decentralized autonomous organization that runs like a DeFi app. They can do things like say, hey, we want to create a proposal to take the money that's already sitting in our smart contract and give it to this person for, you know, some, some reason, right? And then you can actually create a proposal, put it on chain, and then people who hold the tokens can vote on chain whether they actually want to make that money move out of the smart contract to somebody else's wallet for X purpose. And then the blockchain can actually facilitate that process in a completely decentralized way that can't be tampered with. And so if you think about it, like that's like for Dow treasuries and like investment purposes or like treasury management, 
like that's basically the same problem that the scientific community has. Like if you have funding and that funding is supposed to go somewhere to help advance some sort of cause, then you could really automate this entire process with decentralized autonomous organizations and allow people to coordinate you know, online across the globe in ways that remove this centralization and gatekeeping that typically, you know, is is a problem in the scientific community right now. All right. So that's the problem of coordination and how blockchain technology can actually fix this. But let's talk about funding now. This is the next point. So I'm not talking about funding a second ago and how, you know, you can move money around. But I want to drill down on the point of uh, grants. Okay. So, you know, the scientific community heavily relies upon grants to do research, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, as I was doing, you know, research for this video, you know, I found out that it's common for scientists to basically spend maybe half of their time, you know, trying to get grants or, or you know, do things related to grants for their scientific projects. Now, again, I'm no scientific expert by any stretch of the imagination, but if that's even close to true, then that's really slowing down the effectiveness of scientists. And imagine what you could do if you could free up all that time where you could be, you know, just doing science. Imagine the amount of progress we could make if we took all the bright minds around the world right now and then basically increase their productivity by 50%. That could actually have a compounding effect on progress, not simply just a 2x increase. Now, in addition to this, you know, like I was talking about before, whenever you're applying for grants and you receive funding from small, you know, sort of closed entities, that can come with strings attached, okay? That means that you might not be able to collaborate with certain people, you know, whenever you're doing this, or it really narrows the scope of what you can, you know, work on. But what if we could change the incentives on this to essentially broaden that scope you know, increase who you can collaborate with, the brightest minds can actually get together. Imagine what that would do to speed up progress if we didn't have all these constraints, you know, heaped on top of this. And that's what we can do by essentially redefining how we do grants. Okay, so basically, if you can try to create new ways to receive funding where you can change the rules because you don't have gatekeepers defining what those are, then that could be a massive game changer. So how would you do that with blockchain? Well, we already have this type of thing happening uh, with like Gitcoin, for example. So Gitcoin is a grants protocol that's powered on chain. Essentially, what happens is you write a proposal for funding, you put it out there, and people can just basically fund these efforts through the platform. We even have pretty interesting features like quadratic funding. You know, we already have some traction with this. You can get on, uh, you know, Gitcoin, look at the grants, see at some different you know, projects that are out there and see how this works for yourself, you know, hands on. All right, so this big category where DSI can really like change the game is with publishing. We're talking like scientific journals, peer reviews, all that type of stuff. So basically, I'll just take this right off the Ethereum Network website. So science publishing is famously problematic because it's managed by publishing houses that rely upon free labor from scientists, reviewers, and editors to generate the papers, but then charge exorbitant publishing fees. Then basically, the public who have to rely upon this, they're basically paying for it through publication costs, through taxation, and they often can't access the same work without paying the publisher again. So the idea here, how you can fix this problem, both for for both sides, right? The, the scientists who are contributing to this and also people that want access to the data is that essentially taking scientific knowledge and turning it over to something like public goods, okay? And so how does that actually become sustainable? Well, that goes back to the Gitcoin model, which I was talking about a minute ago, because Gitcoin is all about, you know, public goods funding. Now, let's talk about on the other side of things, you know, with uh, the actual scientists who are contributing to this problem, you know, in terms of peer review. So like I was talking about before, you know, the very centralized model that we have now, your peer review work is unpaid, benefiting, you know, for-profit publishers. But with something like decentralized science, you could actually have things like token incentives where you could earn tokens for doing the peer review process, but you could also establish reputation on chain because, of course, there'd be this, you know, temptation or incentive to just try to like earn money and maybe crank out reviews, but they want to actually be quality. And then, you know, your reputation be determined in a decentralized way, the quality of your work. And then, you know, you could, of course, be incentivized to continuing doing those types of reviews. All right. So the way that this can really change the game is with intellectual property or IP. OK, so basically intellectual property is a big problem in traditional science from being stuck in universities or unused in biotechs to being notoriously hard to value. Uh, well, basically, we can kind of change that problem by making all this stuff you know, open with blockchains, but we have a secret weapon called non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Now, of course, the most common use case for NFTs today at the time of recording this video is digital collectibles, you know, things like Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunks, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of people who like love them or hate them. They just don't take them seriously because you think you can right click save them. You know, I definitely am rooting for NFTs to succeed in the long term. But what I am most excited about are the use cases beyond digital collectibles where you can model anything that's non-fungible of value on chain. I've talked about this for a long time. Things like physical real estate, intellectual property. And this is a great use case for 
you know, creating intellectual property in an open decentralized way on chain where the IP isn't just gate kept inside of centralized entities. It's open and transparent so that it can do things like reward researchers, governing bodies, or even the subject whose data is collected. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about that's a big game changer is basically the idea of uh, permanence and open access to the body of scientific research that's out there. Okay. So let's talk about some specific problems that face the scientific community and how we can improve this with blockchain. So uh, let's talk about this. Basically, you know, sometimes scientific facts can just go missing or scientific research, I should say, can go missing. Things like artifacts, code, data that can't actually be reproduced. So let's say that you have some sort of finding, you've documented you have the methodology, you've documented the data that you've used, but then basically you want your own team to be able to reproduce it. But then let's say that you want anybody to be able to replicate those same results. Well, a lot of times, again, this data could go missing. The code that you might use to replicate this might go missing. And so you can fix these problems by putting these things on decentralized you know, file storage systems like IPFS, for example, or maybe putting some, some particular parts even on chain itself. So again, what is IPFS? It's not really a blockchain, but it works kind of like a blockchain. It's basically it's a decentralized network of nodes that all talk to one another where you can just put any files that you want to on it and they can stay there forever. You can get a hash back to go get that information. So... Let's say that you had some you know, big paper where you publish your findings. You could put your data set to all that type of stuff on IPFS. You know, you could open source the code. If you need to manipulate that data set in any way, that'd be on GitHub, or maybe you can just take the code and zip it and put that version on IPFS and then anybody you know, could download that. So let's say you published a paper, you could even put the paper on IPFS, right? And then it could even reference each part, like the data and the code to another IPFS hash. And then anybody could just pull that stuff down and then replicate it. All right, so that's an overview of decentralized science or DSI and how we can use blockchain and Web 3.0, all these technologies to improve the scientific enterprise now. Again, this has got a ton of traction already, and I expect this trend to grow in the coming years because this really makes sense. So I hope you like this video. You know, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That leaves this video is out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fast in this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? When well, you can go to my YouTube homepage, you can find those free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you went to the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You really don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.